my theory. Um, for those of you who know me or don't know me, my name is Teresa Lyons, and I'm counsel of the Board Improvement Program, and I, um, I have a private practice in Morgantown, um, West Virginia. The name of it is Lyonsville Legal Group, and my email is there in case you have, if you have any follow-up questions um, throughout this case. So, anyhow, I spoke about two years ago about the GAL disposition report and tips to streamline it, streamline the report, and this report, um, this session is eligible for law office management. So it's a little bit more nuts and bolts. Um, I've tried to do a lot of theory, but it is designed with law office management credits in mind. So I, the last, again, I spoke on this topic two years ago, and I tell you, I've written a few reports. I've done some the hard way, and I've done some the, what I consider the easy way. And I know they're difficult, but I, I also know they're very important, and it's very important for effective advocacy for your child client. And if you can remember that when you're writing one and you're and you're doing it at the last minute, it is a, an essential piece of your role as a guardian ad litem. Now, sometimes it's I find it's good to go back and review things that you think you already know. You know, it's easy to say, I know, I know. I've written reports a hundred times, but sometimes looking at the basics and just going over the basics of doing a report is helpful. So, the, the first thing I want to mention is you want to calendar the due date for your report, and you want to put it on a calendar that you can see. Now, I know it's it's not like a an answer to a complaint in a civil case. It's not going to be treated like that. However, it is important. So you really want to do that. I also like to have it on a calendar that um, I have my daily schedule. So perhaps I have everything, you know, this big blank space there. But I also notice that I have a due date there as well and it reminds me not to schedule something else because I don't have anything to do. Oh, I'm open and I have all this extra time. So it's really helpful to account for that. One thing, one thing I had also thought I'd mention is I had done some reading and talked to some um, business owners, not lawyers, and one business owner said, you know, I used to schedule my day. Um, I would do a loose schedule, you know, block my time at the end of the day and throughout the day and see if I can follow it. And I also noticed that that hint was um, in a column on tips for entrepreneurs. And I know we like to think as lawyers we're kind of special, but that actually has been very effective in doing that and getting me back to if I put time for a GAL report down, maybe I put two hours and I get interrupted and I only have one hour, but I've made some progress on it. So that's important. Another, I did some research when I was preparing this presentation and one common theme with regard to GAL reports is to use subheadings to organize your discussion, especially in some of the longer <coughs> Um, sections of the report. So that that is very helpful to do. And it just organizes things. It keeps it lets your reader know what's what's going on. Um, and it also might keep your topics in the same place. You know, keep all your comments organized. You know, in terms of starting well before the due date, I know, you know, I need that reminder more than you do, but it's important to think about that. If you give yourself enough time and you're writing um, for an hour a day, say, um, 
five or six days out from the due date, it's helpful and it's not as stressful. I uh, used to do a lot of long distance running and I always liked it at the end of the race that I felt good and that's I take that same philosophy with regard to GAL reports and it's something to think about. Now my former partner, um, he liked to let things go to the last minute and that's just what he did and that for him that was the way to do it. But you might want to think about that. You can use a reverse checklist which um, means that you would say days, six days out, um, complete the first two sections, second, uh, five days out, complete section, the next section, four days out, then you complete that. If you already know your recommendations, you might write those early in the case. So that's, it, that's worth thinking about. And that's something that Ryan Garner is a, legal grammar, he's a legal writing specialist. He, is a, he does have a JD and he recommends doing. Now, he, he also talks about, um, you know, very high dollar cases with lots of, lots of attorneys in it, but the same principles are applicable to you as the guardian ad litem. A lot of um, certain parts of the the report can be written before they're due. Now, I know Natalie talked a long time about different parts of an investigation. If you write, either write those up as you go, it's gonna be helpful if you keep notes that you can then just cut and paste, it, you know, or copy and paste and put them in, into your report. It's very helpful. If you write some sections during the course of the case, and again, and again, that just helps you at the end to get a better finished product. Um, it's more detailed and it also then um, is just not as onerous because I, I'm like you, I don't have time in what, I usually cannot find two days in a week to sit down and block my calendar and do nothing but do right. Because invariably I have review hearings, I have I have other deadlines and I have phone calls. And I might need, to, I might have a new case and I have to call somebody. So that's, it's always good to give yourself more time to, with regard to doing a report. In terms of timely submission, you, you know, it's, you know that the reports do five days before the disposition hearing. And I typically, uh, try to follow this it's it's not easy I've had to, I've been late sometimes but it's important to look at that timely submission and why it's important it'll support if you have a circuit court judge who reads and some judges I practice in front of read will read your report if you give them more time they will there's a possibility they are going to read it and follow your recommendations so I think that's important. If you have a judge who doesn't read, they may read it during the course of a disposition hearing and, and flip through to your recommendations, and that's important. It also will help support the judge when the judge is making a ruling and, and it's being considered, a case is being considered on appeal. That's also important. Um, I, I did a search and I was trying to look for cases that the court was discussing um, reliance on a guardian, guardian ad litem report. And there were so many cases that I thought, I'm not even gonna cite to one or two cases. So it's important to think about that. I practice in Vaughn County and one thing in Vaughn County is we rotate. We're not just guardians ad litem, we're not just a Adult Respondents Council. So we rotate through. And, and because of that, I really have a lot of respect for res Adult Respondents Council and what they're gonna do. And I like to give it, give the report early so that, so Respondents Council will have time to sit down with their client and discuss the recommendations. And you may get to a, you may get to a stipulated disposition 
if you do that. And then that's important to think about. It just a little more time will prepare people. So again, I know five days before, I, you know, I get handed court summaries on the way in the door sometimes. I'm sure you all do too. I try to um, not do that with the GAL report because I think it's so important. Now, I don't always agree with the DHHR or the prosecutor. And I'm sure that's shocking news um, to people that I work with, and I'm sure you don't always agree with them. And I find if you put your report out there and it's well supported, then the prosecutor and the DHHR worker will consider it. And I've actually had them line up with me um, more times than not if I if I put it out there early enough. So it's worth it's worth a shot. Um, Sometimes they don't, but at least it lets them know that. So I think that's important to consider. It, a good case that you might want to, if you ever want to read, is the case of MM, and in that case, the GAL recommended against an improvement period. The department was originally going to go with an improvement period, and then they didn't. Uh, <laughs> the circuit court ultimately did not grant an improvement period. And so that was that's something to consider and that's something what you, that your report will do. And it's it's helpful. It gives people more time. So um, as I was getting ready for this report and as I was writing my last uh, guardian ad litem report which had to be due about two or three weeks ago, um, I kept thinking, what am I going to talk about? And I want to do something different. And I thought, well, you know, it would be really good. I know the GAL, there's this form for GALs. And, and I thought, you know what would help me is if I had a bunch of questions I had to answer all through the case, or I had a checklist to follow all through the case, like Jeffrey or L. And I thought, maybe I'll write some. Maybe I'll, so I, I thought, I'll, I'll do that, but I decided that I would go back and read Appendix B, and lo and behold, Appendix B actually has directions for completion of the report, and that's different from the form. Now, that's available on the West Virginia Supreme Court website. I didn't put that. Um, I did not put that as an attachment to the presentation, but you, you all can take a look at it. You can probably pull it up right now. And where you have to go is to the rules section. Go to court rules section. Then you go to circuit court, and then you go to the child abuse and neglect rules. And there are directions for completing the report, and they're very helpful. Those are the questions that I wish I had had. <laughs> and I had them, I just didn't know about that. They have, a, there is also the form report um, on, in the same place on the West Virginia Supreme Court website. And it is available in both a Word document and a PDF document. So you can download it if you want to. And there's some, the actual form for the report has some questions or some prompts that will help you with the report. So that, that's something to look at and consider. I assume that you, if you have um, Adobe, the professional version, you can also use the, use the PDF version, but the Word version is probably easier to work with. And then, and then I, I went and looked um, at the way other jurisdictions handle guardian ad litem report. And honestly, I couldn't find very many at first. I typically found presentations on report writing and family court. But there are reports. I found two templates, one from Fayette County, Kentucky, and one from Minnesota. Now, I attached those. Um, I don't believe they're part of the presentation, but they should be available later. And they're just something to think about and look at. And I know you can't see real well, 
the Fayette County one is, is pretty much <coughs> open-ended and you ask questions and it's something to think about and you may, it may be a useful tool for you to adapt for your own work if you're, if you like doing this. And I don't think you should be form driven, but I think sometimes a good use of, if you use a form like a checklist, it's very helpful to have something. Oh yes, I forgot to check on that. So. The Minnesota report is more of a chart and it's submitted before every hearing. But again, it's, it's a pretty good idea and it's a way of keeping track of visits with the child. And it, it might be something that you want to adapt internally. It's, you know, you wouldn't use this to submit to the court, but it's something to look at and consider because a lot of, and there are not a lot of states that have a lot of explicit instructions on guardians at life. So I'm going to tell you, West Virginia is probably a little bit ahead of the curve. So we may be low on other things, but usually with law, we're pretty progressive. So in getting there. So. Now, we, I heard some talk about um, confidentiality, and you want to think, and somebody mentioned a letter to the judge. Now the GAL is can read seal or redact information that's included in the report. And that's right in those directions. It indicates that. I have not had a situation that that's what I wanted I wanted to do, but it's something to think about. Trial court rule ten oh three gives you a procedure for doing this because although the report says you can do this, it doesn't give you a procedure, but trial court rule 1003 contemplates filing a motion, submitting a proposed order, and it's that you specify the nature of, of how long you want it sealed, maybe forever, so, and you just put that in. And that also makes it easier on the judge's staff or the circuit clerk's office who are helping with it. So it's worth considering following that procedure. It's just an easy way to make sure that something that you intend to be confidential, in fact, remains confidential because not everything does. Um, so even giving envelopes that something is in. So all somebody has to do is seal it and, and the judge writes across it sealed in the day. You know, that's a helpful thing to do. Making other people's jobs easier, it always gets better results for me. I, I'm not gonna go through every part of the report writing, but I wanted to talk some, about some of the different things that you want to go over. There's a section called general information and I like to think of this. These are the players in the children's lives and you know you have siblings, you have half siblings. Now some of these half siblings might be 20 years older than your child client and they, and they don't know them and they probably will never know them. Some of your half siblings, I have a case right now, the, there are some half siblings that are like 19 and 21. And although they're not going to provide a home for these children, they have actually been doing visits with them periodically. And it's been really helpful for these children um, to have this relationship. And they're not going to serve as as a placement, but they're an important family contact. And these children are going, once the ICPC gets approved, they're going to Florida. <laughs> so, um, you want to identify relatives, step parents, you want to identify parents, significant <coughs> others. And in, in the instructions on the report, they talked about naming the foster parents. And I would say that's a matter of discretion. Sometimes adult respondents know foster parents' names. They've been at the MBT. Um, I think you need to think about that. You may want to talk to the foster parents. You may want to use a descriptor uh, as opposed to 
actually naming a foster parent. I had one of my very first cases was very difficult and the mother, the biological mother kept tracking the teenager down even after the adoption and the adoption disrupted. So you, you want to think about that. I'm not saying never name the foster parents. Just consider your situations, individualize that. You might want to see if a, if a child has a sibling relationship within the foster home. That child may have not a blood relationship with, with a foster brother or foster sister, but they consider that child, that person to be their brother or sister. And I think that's important to note. So the judge knows all this. This is, you're doing a big picture of this child. So, so um, you also might want to um, identify any relatives such as um, grandparents and things like that. So it's just important to give that information to the judge. The more information, the better. Um, and it will help the judge understand who is important to this child. <coughs> now, the procedural history section is important. And I know it's easy to go on uh, January 2nd, 2019, <coughs> I mean, I, you know, but you can do a little more than that with this, this section. You can note your prior voluntary, any prior voluntary relinquishments, any involuntary terminations, and you want to identify the court and the case number, and if it's in a different county, if your judge knows, your judge may have handled it if it's in the same county, but it may be from a different county. In a sentence or two, um, it, and going back to noting any prior involuntary terminations or relinquishments, you know, judges are not omniscient. You know, you, we sort of think they are, but they forget just like we do, and they may remember some things and not everything. So it's important give them um, give them the details, so it will help them do a better job. You want to address the circumstances that led to the filing of the petition. I wouldn't make this very long. I would do it in a sentence or two. This is this kind of case. You know, just give that to the, to the judge. And think about, if you look at memorandum decisions, you know, that sort of sentence will, is, occurs in those opinions. So you want to just identify in a, in a sentence or two what it is. Attendance, you can note the attendance of parents at hearings. I've, I've just had a couple cases recently where I have had parents just totally drop off the face of the earth. I think that's important to note if they haven't, haven't maintained the interest in the case. And I know just attendance at hearings only doesn't tell the whole story. Somebody could, can still be very difficult, but it's certainly something to know. If you have a waiver or a stipulation, you know, I would note that. I think that's important to, to indicate. If you have a stipulated adjudication and the parent admitted that they have a problem, they have a problem with drugs, then that will make, I think that's a difference. If you have some procedural quirk, you know, it's important to go ahead and specify that. I think, um, you know, you get down a case and I'm amazed, you know, six months, eight months into a case, you might not remember what happened. The judge might not remember what happened. The Supreme Court may wonder what happened. So if you just sort of explain that, again, in a sentence or two, that's helpful to, um, helpful to the court and it's important to, you know, it just explains things. And finally, you want to look at the length of time that a child has been in foster care. And the magic number, of course, is that the, the department needs to ask for the termination of parental rights at 15 months if they've been in there. 
I think it makes a difference. If a child's been in care for eight months is a big difference from 15 months. I mean, eight months is a long time, but 15 months is, is way long, and especially if you think of a young child. And if you can remember um, being a child, I used to think summer vacation lasted forever, and now I turn around and go, what summer? You know, I, I was working the whole time, and I didn't go on vacation. <laughs> so, but it's important to look at look at the time a child has <coughs> been in foster care. When you consider your contact, that section on contact with the child, it's important to know who was present. And, and sometimes, you know, you may have a certain parent person's presence may affect your communication with the child, and you might want to think about that. Um, you know, sometimes, or if you're in the in the foster home, you're alone, you know, but the foster parent is over in the kitchen, you want to think about that. That may make a difference in what that child says to you. Now, I, I have a child, I was kind of worried, she's 11, and she's, she's pretty good, and I kept worrying about it, and, but finally, I went to, actually, I met her at a doctor's office visit, she's diabetic, she was in town, we were going to, because of um, concerns with snow, I went ahead and went to the um, doctor's appointment, and then we talked a little bit after the waiting room. And I thought, she's, you know, it's not the foster mother that's keeping her from telling me this, because she came out and said something to me. And that's not it. And I had been concerned. So, again, that's something to think about. Um, I, my personal feeling is frequency of contact is probably more important than duration. You know, you might think an hour with the child. And again, it depends on the child and what they're doing and, and what you're doing. Um, I'm like Natalie, who was talking about having games. You know, that's the way to talk to a lot of kids. Or, you know, you get an older kid. I remember I have one girl. <laughs> I would try to talk to her and she'd put her hoodie up and put her head down on, on the desk. You know, and, but you know, my feeling was, you know, I, I, I talk to dogs or horses, you know, and they don't talk back, it's okay. You know, it's, you know, presence is important. With regard to in-home visits, you wanna consider the child's interactions with his or her parents, her, their biological parents, and also their interactions with foster parents or siblings, siblings, um, any way you look at it. Now, I, it was kind of interesting. I had a case about, I think it's been two years, and for some reason, I can't even remember why, I was substitute counsel in that case, and uh, it was, I was really on the fence as to whether the family should be reunified and I took the mother down because nobody else could do it because it involved crossing straight lines. So I took this mother down to a placement to see her child and, and the present she bought her child really made a difference to me. She brought, she, he unpacked toys. She brought him toys. And then she unpacked, she gave him underwears, underwear, socks, and pajamas. And I thought, this mother is thinking about the, the needs of this child. And, and that made a significant difference. Um, and somebody else was asking the question earlier, what do, you know, if respondents counsel don't let me talk to the, the adult respondent, I would say, um, it's a short-sighted, it's a very short-sighted um, strategy on the part of Respondents Council because I find that it's helpful um, and I encourage it. I, I don't take unfair advantage of respondent, of our, an adult respondent and I will, I will tell it and I don't give them advice. I, you know, talk to your lawyer about that if for some reason they're not there. But that's something to think about. 
In terms of information that you get and you obtain from interviews and observation, this is the part that I would indicate. I think subheadings is helpful. Um, I would, you know, emphasize objective facts. I try to be as specific as you can. Um, you might want to avoid personal opinions because the more objective your report is, is the more credible it's going to sound. Now, I, I stuck this third um, bullet point in about only using a diagnosis when there's a professional diagnosis because I know, and you probably have a good idea of what somebody might be diagnosed with. We are not psychologists, and we need to think about that. And this was in a GAL report, and and you know, it was in a GAL report training that said only use a diagnosis if somebody has actually been diagnosed with it. Um, you can point to behaviors that you see that are problematic, but don't go the extra step. And again, it just um, leads to. Credibility. Uh, you want to look at the parties' respective living environments. What is that like? Um, and that makes that makes a big difference if you're considering, especially if you're considering reunification. You want to go to that home and make sure it's okay. And you want to put that in your report. Tell the judge what it's like. A child, you know, children don't come out and say things, and they. I have found it interesting that there are reasons, as many reasons to talk as there are to not talk. And they don't always think to talk, but sometimes they have a vested interest in not talking to you. But their behavior might tell you something. And so it's important to observe that child's behavior. I didn't observe this um, recently, but I had a grandparent said that they went to um, say something to the child, and the child immediately ducked like he was going to get back backhanded. And, you know, that let me know something, and that's something I'm going to look for, and you want to think about it. You want to look at the child's interactions and summarize this with parents, siblings, relatives, peers. You know, get to know that child and let the judge know something about it. Now, in terms of being objective and factual, this is a slide from the Casa Lake County, um, and I'm not sure which state that is, but this is just an example of something the top <coughs> sentence is not, um, not as specific. The second one is, is more specific, and you, it really hones on observations. And I can tell you the last report I was doing, I felt like I was struggling with being specific. And, and that, you know, it's just something to think about when you're doing it, when you're doing a GAL report. If the more specific you can be, the better off that your report is going to be. Now, you want to, you know, you don't want to, you want to look at the big picture too. Don't spend forever on it, something that's not important because people get bored, judges get bored, they read a lot and they don't want to keep, they, you know, if you're talking about trees and the judge wants to see the forest, that's what I would, you know, you want to remember that. With regard to the child's current status, you, I, I've had a bunch of cases where I have six kids in a family or five kids in a family. I found it helpful to discuss each child individually. And, and um, I think it's important to do that and look at what the child has to say. Um, you want to look at whether the placement meets the child's needs. And that's, of course, important throughout the case. But I, I've had a couple of placements that have been pretty bad in the last year. And then I've had children moved, um, and they have gone to exceptionally good foster homes after that that just worked. And that has made a difference in my recommendation. I make sure I note that and talk about that. Um, 
I had, you know, the most striking example is I had a child we were um, looking at sending him to child help, which is down in Lignum, Virginia. Um, that child, I mean, if, and I hate residential. I mean, anybody who works with me knows I hate residential. And and I so we couldn't get the ICPC done, and and the caseworker moved him to a woman to somebody in Martinsburg, and that woman has done wonders with him, and the school system there has done wonders with him. And as opposed to, I had him in one county, I was getting her a call every day, and he, the kid is getting kicked out of school every day. And he was in first grade, I mean, so, you know, it was, and now I get reports about how good he's doing and how in fact he's gonna be off a of behavioral plan. So, you know, that's something to think about. The status of parental visitation, the Supreme Court recognizes that that's an important factor in the interest of a parent with their child. So you want to look at that. Um, you want to look, education is so important to children. When it's all said and done, they're going to grow up at whether we think they will or not. And if they don't have a good education, at, it's not good. So you want to pay attention to all those things, any strengths that they have, any challenges, current grades. You may not want to list all the current grades, but it's something to think about. Um, and if you need some help, the West Virginia FAST program is very helpful with IEPs and things like that. <coughs> Uh, medical needs, if any, if the child has any medical needs, you want to note those. I have a child that's diabetic who was put on an insulin pump um, during her stay in foster care. So that's not going to be in every case, but you know that's something to think of. If they have psychological needs that aren't being met, you want to note that. You want to talk about that. I, that's included in medical needs. Um, look at services that would benefit the child. And I know you can't get a tutor through Medicaid, um, but I, uh, I always put that, I always try to put that in because sometimes that's one less thing a foster parent has to do. And sometimes I feel like I just shoot for the moon a little bit um, with what I want to recommend. So, and sometimes I get it. So if it's better to ask and, and not get than to not get because you didn't ask. So you want to think about contact with siblings or, or relatives. You know, and then finally, I think it's important to look at this, just the child as a person. A child who's not just a, a kid that's subject to an abuse and neglect case. Know something personal about them, something they like, something they do well, just something. I think it's important to look at that because, you know, it's their people. They're people just like our children are people. So I think that's, uh, that's important. Um, with regard to evidentiary consideration, I I don't think that children should testify in these cases. I've, I've never put a child on and I've always found a different way to go about it. And, and that's a rebuttable presumption. I also think that you want to watch doing it in a back door way. So you want to think about when you're quoting something a child says that you know, just think about it. I'm not saying you never do it, but just think about that. I had, especially family court, GAL, um, continuing ed education says never quote a child directly, and I wouldn't go that far, but I just want to think about what children said. Some other states actually bar a GAL from putting any evidence that's inadmissible, but you may want to think about that and think about how you're going to lay a foundation for any evidence that you include, um, because this report will help you get ready for a disposition as well. Um, so if that's your use of it, and you may 
oh, you may have forgotten to send a subpoena out. <laughs> and so, you know, it's five days out. I like to give people more time than that. But, you know, if you have to, um, it's a good time to think about it. With regard to parents, you want to um, discuss, I like to discuss parents individually because most of the time they're not going to stay together or, you know, one, you know, it's just important to think about that. You want to look at their medical or emotional or psychological matters. You want to look at their compliance with court orders. Uh, again, compliance isn't everything. It's attitude towards parenting, but that's something to think about. Uh, I find it helpful. Caseworkers are really good about getting some information, and they're not so good at getting court records. So if the parent has a criminal charge, it's worth taking a look at the court file and seeing what's involved, <laughs> Um, whether there's been any revocation. I, if you can get um, a release to talk to a probation officer, that's helpful. I think you, most times you're going to need a release. But again, um, another thing that's important is to get family court orders. Paternity may well be established, may well have been established five years ago, but nobody knows because they didn't get the order. And, and I'm surprised, you know, and it's not just respondents in adult in abuse and neglect cases. I, I see this in private cases as well. Somebody goes, well, we had an order. And I go, well, where's that order? I need a copy of that. And they go, well, uh, you know, it's somewhere. So go the extra step, you know, go to your clerk's office and get that. You might um, want to look at the parents' living arrangements, especially if you're looking at reunification or even if you're not especially if they just got a house especially Morgantown this is a big problem because rents are astronomical you want to look at is this realistic are they going to be able to keep that house um, is there enough food in the house do they have either food stamps and or um, access to food pantries do they know where the food pantries are um, do you have any concerns about who the parents let in the home? You know, that's something to think about. If, assuming that you're um, recommending, well, even if not, I, I like to include a quick citation to the relevant code sections. And these are some of the things that you can use as the basis for doing that. And cite to a relevant case or two, if you go through the bench book, there's a whole laundry list just on the top of, you know, just go through the sections that will give you a case on what, what the parent did. So you want to think about that. I always like to go back and think about my recommendations. And we hear a lot about the three things that are important in a child welfare case. Safety, permanency, and well-being for children. That's the point of these cases. The point is not to be 100% fair or whatever. And so I like to see how does, I, have, I like to ask myself, how does my recommendation promote safety or permanency or well-being? It's just something to think about it. And you get to put the best interest of the child, but you know that's always a good thing to include in that section. Now, I typically don't then do a repeat of the conclusion, but you know that's just my, that's usually I've said what I'm gonna say by that point, I'm not gonna repeat it. And of course, you all always wanna think about this, uh, the spell, <laughs> spell check doesn't catch everything, so. <laughs> I wish it did. <laughs> Grammar check doesn't ca um, catch everything either, so. Well, that's my presentation. I hope your next GAO report is not too difficult to write, and I hope you do write it and remember how important it is, and um, appreciate your time. Uh, Bob Wilkinson is going to come up and speak to you next. So.